I'd like to thank everyone for coming out tonight. Thank you. Um, really excited about tonight. Um, to give you a little overview of what Startup Dream Team is, if this is your first time. Um, it started with Pierre, uh, myself, and a couple other guys out here today. Just wanted to do it for fun. Um, we're all entrepreneurs, and we wanted to really get in touch and learn from the experts and the people who've actually been there. It's been a great journey so far. Um, we're about to end next week. Um, but it's been great, and the people we've had so far, we've had Heaton Shaw, Marcus Nelson, um, Director of Zappos, Will Young, um, Drew from Dropbox as well, and uh, yeah, we're very happy to have um, Mike Maples here today. He's been an awesome guy when it comes to what he's done in the past. He's the founder and managing partner of Floodgate, um, but before I introduce him, I want to introduce um, Director Riley Pad. tell a little bit about herself. What's your name again? Vanessa? Vanessa. Vanessa. <laughs> Thank you. Hello, everybody. My name is Teresa Hodges. I work with Rally.org. Welcome to the RallyPad. Uh, RallyPad is a nonprofit incubator and also for social enterprise. Um, and we basically provide resources for them to grow and develop. Uh, through rally.org. We provide resources such as lunch and learns and rally roundtables and events such as these. Uh, rally.org is actually a social fundraising platform and RallyPad is a commitment as a part of our, is a commitment as a part of the Clinton Global Initiative. So welcome to the RallyPad. If you have any questions about rally.org, feel free to ask me. Natalie upstairs is also great at answering any questions about rally.org or RallyPad. So thank you. And Mike Maples. Thanks. So, so j just to get a little bit of a feel for um, uh, who's here tonight, how many of you are entrepreneurs? Wow. Okay. Cool. I'm in the right place since I fund startups. Uh, how many of you are from the U.S.? Uh, how many are from Europe? How many are from anywhere else in the world? Oops. Canada? Okay. <laughs> okay. Awesome. So we have a very uh, multinational but fairly uniform audience in terms of uh, passion for entrepreneurship. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk about a couple of things. You know, maybe before I get started, I should just give you a little bit uh, of my own background. So uh, w once upon a time, I was young too, and I was an entrepreneur back in those days. And so um, I was involved with a couple of startups in enterprise software down in Austin, Texas. And um, we had some pretty good luck. And so um, both of those companies ended up going public. So um, one company that I was involved with very early uh, was called Tivoli Systems, an enterprise software company. Uh, and then the second was uh, a company called Motive, which focused on broadband software. And um, in 2004, we went public about a week and a half after Google. And um, I, was, I was really tired. Uh, you know, it, it's hard, it, well, a lot of you probably understand this. When you're an entrepreneur, uh, you just have to will that sucker into existence. And, you know, you got, you got to be part of something before there's anything to join. And, you know, about 10 years of that takes a lot out of you. And so I thought, you know, I'm going to, I just need to take a break. So um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do what everybody wants to do when they don't want to work quite as hard. I'm going to become a venture capitalist. And so I thought, well, that's what I'll do. I'll become a VC. Uh, but there were, and, and then I came, I tried to figure out where all the good startups were. And I thought, well, I, I need to be in a place, if I'm going to be, if I'm not going to want to work quite as hard, I also ought to be in a place where I don't have to travel as much. That'd be even better. And so, you know, if I lived in California, uh, I, could, I, could, I could probably never travel and I could invest and do the VC thing, and, but still kind of keep active uh, and, and be forever young, you know, and, and work with startups. And so, so that's what I did. I moved from Austin, Texas one day uh, up to Silicon Valley. And in fact, um, my kids were still at school. So my daughter, Sydney, uh, is <laughs> actually here today. Uh, she was uh, brave enough to come with me. She works at Mod Cloth. And so I said, if you want to ride home, you got to sit here uh, while, we, while we do this. Uh, but but um, I would, uh, I'd fly up every Sunday night and, uh, and just parachute into Silicon Valley and try to find something exciting in Silicon Valley by Thursday. And then I would come back and just let the cycle repeat. And so, you know, I immigrated to Silicon Valley. And one of the things I learned pr pretty early on is that uh, no venture firm would hire me. 
And uh, like, I guess in hindsight, it's pretty obvious why I had never made a venture investment before. And I was from Austin, Texas. I had no network in Silicon Valley. And so um, necessity sort of became the mother of invention. Uh, if I was going to get a job in the venture business, I was gonna, just going to have to start my own thing. And at about the same time, um, I ran into some people and I saw that there was a big change happening in the way startups got started. Uh, one of the first companies I ever funded was uh, Dig from Kevin Rose. And Kevin had started Dig for $1,500 over a weekend. And that was really different from the world I'd come from. I'd come from a world where it cost $5 million just to get into the game. And so I started to look at more and more of these companies and I came to the conclusion that 500,000 was the new 5 million. And that uh, it took less money than ever to start a company. It took less money than ever to prove or disprove an idea. And that was because of a combination of factors. Broadband penetration, universal connectivity of, of customers, uh, open source software. Uh, it hadn't happened yet, but variableized cost web services all made it possible to experiment at low burn faster than ever before. And so um, I started Floodgate in the summer of 2006 and had a pretty good run of beginner's luck, mostly because I had no competition and n nobody wanted to fund startups 500,000 at a time. Everybody wanted to either put no money into a startup or $5 million into a startup. And so some of the companies that we got involved with in addition to Dig were uh, uh, my second investment turned out to be Twitter, uh, and then when I raised my first fund, my first investment in Fund One was a, a textbook rental site called Chegg, uh, and then uh, we've we've had a couple of successes in gaming, Playdom and NG Moco, uh, for example, uh, and then uh, we, it, it's kind of funny. I didn't realize until about three hours ago that that this was where the speech was going to be. But uh, now I realize, you know, we also funded Rally. Uh, and so, um, you know, that's kind, of, that's kind of a fun coincidence that, that we're giving this talk at the Rally Pad. So one of the things I should, so, so I should probably, now that I've given you a little sense of my background, um, I, should, I should give some people a little bit of a warning about some of my biases. So some of you are going to want to start companies that have a different point of view than I have. And that's okay, but I feel like it's important for me to be honest and put all my cards on the table so you kind of know where I'm coming from and then you can decide to pay attention or just discard everything I say. Um, but, but basically, my fundamental belief is that there's a small number of very special companies, that the high-tech business is a business of exceptionalism. Uh, I call these special companies thunder lizards. And so, how many people have ever heard about what a thunder lizard is before? Okay, so, you know, we've got some education to do. Uh, so, um, I, I got the metaphor of the thunder lizard from Godzilla. So, um, for those of you who've never, have, has anybody ever watched Godzilla before? Okay, okay. So, Godzilla, for those of you who don't remember all the details, uh, was hatched from radioactivated atomic eggs. And then he swam across the Pacific Ocean and emerged with an attitude and uh, started destroying things and disrupting things. So for example, he starts out by devouring startup competitors, but then pretty soon starts to attack incumbents, you know, breathing fire on things, uh, throwing trains in the air, uh, swiping holes into the sides of buildings. And to me, that was always just a good metaphor for the awesome startup. Uh, you know, the awesome startup um, disrupts industries, devours its competitors, turns things upside down, challenges the status quo, and tries to get really big, and tries to create a whole lot of disruption. And, you know, Thunder Lizard to me was sort of more memorable as a term than an MBA jargon sounding term. And so I always just sort of went with it. And so, when I describe my job to people, my job is to hunt th thunder lizards. That's all I'm in it for. To me, there is nothing else. And it's, it's important to understand that not all companies can be or should be thunder lizards. And so not all of you are going to start companies that sort of 
are congruent with the model I'm describing. And then that, that, that's all right. There's plenty of opportunities to create value in this world other than creating a thunder lizard. But, but since I care so much about thunder lizards, I'm going to talk a little bit about the virtues of, of thunder lizards. So um, first of all, how many, how many startups do you all think get funded a year by angels, if you had to guess? You're close. You're low, actually, but you're close. You're in the right order of magnitude. It's, it's, it's over 10,000 a year. How many companies a year do you think get to $100 million of revenue within five years of funding per year? It turns out that it's remarkably consistent. And it's, it's fairly independent of the amount of money invested in companies in a given year. It turns out that there are 10 plus or minus five in a given year. And so that's what I'm in it for, is to find those. And why, why does that happen is kind of an interesting question. Well, it turns out that the, the, the high-tech business is a uniquely magical business. And I say that not out of bias. I say that just out of fact. So the high-tech industry, the industry that most of us are in, has this magical curve called Moore's Law. And because of Moore's Law, we are guaranteed every five to 10 years, there will be a new supply of awesome companies that disrupt the status quo. Because no, no matter how powerful an individual company is, no company is more powerful than the inexorable tide of Moore's Law. Because the longer you give Moore's Law to double the power and price performance of computing, I, I don't care how powerful you are, give me as long as you like and Moore's Law will overturn you. And so that's the magic of the tech, tech business, is that there's always, a, you know, other bubbles are different. The financial services bubble, the housing mortgage bubble, the, the tulip bubble that happened 500 years ago, those bubbles were temporary speculative bubbles. And yes, it's true the tech business gets overvalued from time to time, but the thing people often miss is that the tech industry is the only industry we, we've ever discovered that lives by the law of the exponent. And as long as that remains to be true, we always have, as entrepreneurs, the asymmetric weapon of disruption. And that's why every year there can be 10 plus or minus five new awesome companies. It's so easy to not remember that Facebook wasn't even a company in 2003. 10 years ago, there was no Facebook at all. And here it is, a company now worth over $50 billion. And people are complaining that they had a lousy IPO. Um, that just doesn't happen in any other industry. Uh, there are no Googles in any other industry. There are no Cisco's in any other industry. And so to me, that's what it's all about, is finding those companies, finding those magical companies. And maybe what we should do is um, we'll save some time in the Q&A if, um, if, if you're interested in, we've, we've found some patterns in Thunder Lizards, and what I'd like to do is just offer four common themes. Um, the first common theme that we see is the visionary entrepreneur. And by visionary, I do not mean somebody who sees visions. Uh, you know, that's, uh, there's a difference between a vision and a hallucination. Uh, a visionary entrepreneur has two qualities. One is they're totally authentic to the startup idea. So let, let's take the Maud Cloth example. It was started by a woman named Susan Coger, who had been thrifting for clothes since she was age 13 with her grandmother. Started it in her dorm room at Carnegie Mellon. So at the time that we invested in Maud Cloth, we'd seen 10 fashion deals. And about eight of them were from Stanford MBAs who had a mobile app that was fashion. And my partner, Ann Murako, says, what fashion magazines do you read to these founders? And they said, oh, I don't read any, but fashion's hot, mobile's hot. So we're going to do mobile fashion. That's, th that, we have found, tends to not work. And the reason is that, the reason that authenticity is powerful is that um, love conquers all in a startup. Um, when you have a startup, the world is going to tell you you're wrong over and over again. When you have a startup, you're going to encounter inertia. You're going to encounter customers who don't buy, even though it's irrational for them not to. 
you're going to encounter people who are locked in the conventional wisdom who just don't get it. You're going to encounter multiple near-death experiences. And if you don't believe with all your heart in the idea, you'll give up. It, it, you only fail when you decide to quit. And so the, the, the authentic entrepreneur has the advantage of saying, there's nothing else I could imagine doing in this world but this idea. Uh, that's, why, that's why we invested one of reasons, other than just getting lucky, in Twitter. Evan Williams had started Blogger before. He understood self-expression. He said, you know, if a million people would write blogs, maybe 10 million people would write microblogs. And I was like, I have no clue if people are going to write microblogs. But if anybody's right, he's going to be right. Because who else thinks more about this topic in depth than Evan Williams, right? The inventor of blogger software. And so that's the first thing about a visionary entrepreneur is this total authenticity to the opportunity. And the corollary to that is the ability to be non-consensus and right. And so when you're a startup, uh, how many people have ever been to Africa before? Okay, so like, if you've, or if you've ever seen like on the Nature Channel, when, um, when a baby wildebeest is born, it sort of gets up on the Serengeti plain and it can barely walk and it's all wet, it's coming out of this sack, and it's got like five minutes before it starts running, or its mom's like, sorry, I'm out of here, right? And so, startups are kind of like that. They're incredibly vulnerable. Their product hardly works. They don't have any customers yet. Just even a gust of wind can destroy a startup in the early days. And so the value of being non-consensus and right is that in the early days, you don't want anybody to really care about what you're doing. You know, you want to have time to perfect your product market fit with your early customers so that by the time the world realizes that you were right and they were wrong, it's too late for them to competitively adjust. You've gotten too far down the learning curve and you've beget, begun to build sustainable competitive barriers or network effects in your business. And so the value being not, the, the problem with being consensus and right is that sometimes you're right, but 10 other people are too. And profits are competed away in your market, which makes it harder to raise money, which makes your exit price lower because acquirers have more alternatives of who to buy. What you want to be is the only example. It's like what Jerry Garcia said. Don't be the best, be the only. And the best, the best way to be the only is to be non-consensus and right. To see, to say the world believes it's going right, but I know it's going left. And the reason I know is I know something the world doesn't know by virtue of my authentic, specific knowledge of this market. So to me, that's what the visionary entrepreneur is. The second thing we look for is a huge potential market. And potential, it's like in physics, you know, they talk about potential energy. Uh, a potential market is very subtle, it's hard to predict. Um, an obvious huge market isn't good because a big company will do that. So you have to have the subtlety to realize this market is potentially very large, but we haven't yet converted the potential energy to the mechanical energy of the serve market. Uh, and so that's the second thing we look for. That's the hardest one to get right. The third one is um, a fundamental advantage. What does this company know how to do better than anybody else in the world? What are they world class at? Uh, or do, have they achieved some type of a network effect that has some critical advantage to scale? And then the last thing we look for is uh, modest capital requirements. Uh, we like to believe that the, gr the best startups in the world can start a forest fire with just one match. And that it takes more money to fund a crappy company than a great company. Uh, Microsoft raised $1 million of venture capital ever. eBay raised $5 million of venture capital ever. Yahoo's Series A was a $1 million round. And so we believe very fundamentally that the true measure of a disruptive idea is can I get to critical mass with not much money? because that sums up all the other things that are probably right about it. How disruptive it is, how unique it is, how efficient it is, all of those things. Uh, so those are the four main things. Visionary entrepreneur, huge potential market, fundamental advantage, and modest capital requirements. To us, those are the four fundamental components of Thunder Lizard DNA. Um, now some people had asked me, well, okay, great. Those are the attributes, but how do some Thunder Lizard startups behave? 
you know, what, what makes, for example, the very most successful companies that you've ever worked with more successful than just the fact that they had the right opportunity? W what is it about the team? Uh, and I thought that some of you might find this interesting. So um, how many of you were born after 1969? Is, is anybody in this room born in the 60s or before? Okay, gosh, that's a scary thought. So it's just you and me both, right? So um, this week, uh, I, or last week, I was at uh, Kennedy Space Center. And... Um, is pretty amazing, you know, they have some of the ori original mission control equipment that they used for the moon landing uh, in, in 1969. So, you know, this, this landing happened before most of you in this room were born. Um, it's actually a good time to think about the moon landing because I don't know about how tonight will be, but last night, I think we might have even had a full moon. And, um, you know, sometimes, you know, I'll be outside and it'll be nighttime and I'll look up at that full moon, and I'm just like, how in the heck did they do that? Just think about it. This is, I mean, it's hard to even imagine. 1969, Hewlett Packard hadn't even invented the, the, the personal calculator yet. Um, there was no GPS. There were no cell phones. You had basically barely digital computers telling this rocket made out of aluminum foil how to blast off into space from a moving planet Earth to a moving moon, orbit the moon, land on it, take a little walk and a few pictures, get back in the spacecraft, come back to Earth. I'm still just blown away by it. Um, so why is the moon landing interesting? Well, there are a couple reasons. One is that a lot of startups today, in my opinion, um, don't aim high enough. They come in and they say, I'm going to do Expedia on Facebook. Or they come in and they, they, they come in with a very tactical business idea. And in my view, only the great ideas, this is just my opinion, but in my opinion, only the great ideas are worthy of the sacrifice of an entrepreneur. Um, and, and the, the moon landing sort of always reminds me that there are people that can just do extraordinary things uh, when they set their minds to it. Uh, but the other thing that the moon landing reminds me of is what can we learn from how they did that? Uh, and it turns out that in the early 70s, they did a study on the teams that landed uh, Apollo 11 on the moon. They wanted to understand how did that happen? How did they do that? Uh, and in particular, they came to understand that some teams didn't just perform well, they were super performers. Some teams weren't just 10 times better than most teams. Some teams were a thousand times better. And so they wanted to know, like, how did that happen? And so they came up with a term for these teams, uh, they call them hot teams. Um, and they wanted to understand why do some organizations have hot teams. Uh, and and so, so I spent most of the 90s trying to understand this because I was really interested in how some software companies in particular, but it doesn't just have to be software, why are some companies just so much more productive and effective than others? And here's, here's the basic thing that, that we learned. Hot teams have a systematic way to empower really smart, passionate people. So for example, let's suppose that you want to release a software product. What we learned from hot teams is that if you're the management team, you can define the date or the feature set, but not both. You have to give one of those two things to the team completely. And here's why. So like, let's say that you're a consumer product and you got to have something by Christmas. Then you, you as the management team say, you got to ship this by Christmas, no plan B. Well, then you have to trust the team will define the proper feature set to ship by Christmas. Conversely, you might say, we can't compete in the market without this critical mass of features. Then you have to let the team set the date for that. Why is that true? Well, let's go back to NASA. What they discovered that was true of hot teams is that hot teams 
don't ask management for permission or forgiveness. When a hot team encounters an obstacle, they don't stop and say, okay boss, what should I do? They just blow right past it. They go around it, they go over it, they go through it, they go underneath it. They just act like it wasn't even there. They gave this one example. The only way we were gonna be able to land on the moon was if you put this huge antenna on the top of a mountain that had no roads to it. And we were running out of time. So um, they're like, well, gosh, how do we get this antenna on top of this mountain? Well, let's put it in a huge truck. Well, then we'll have to build a road to the mountain. We don't have time to build a road. So what are we gonna do? Let's put it in a plane. The, you know, we can't. Uh, we can't land it on the mountain. And so somebody else on the team goes, where is the biggest helicopter in the world? And it turns out that it was owned by the Navy. So they call up the Navy and they say, we're NASA and if you don't give us your helicopter, we're not gonna be able to land on the moon when JFK said we would. So they're like, all right, sign us up. How many do you need, right? And so, and by the way, they didn't ask anybody's permission for this stuff. They just got these helicopters, put all the parts of the antenna in the helicopters, up to the top of the mountain, built the antenna. But you guys have probably seen this before when you're in an environment of excellence. You see an environment where there's unpredictable obstacles all the time. And the teams that win are those that feel empowered enough to overcome any obstacle without permission from anybody. Because two things are true. They know that the goal is important, point one, and they can make it happen, point two. Um, you as a startup owner will face the trap over and over again where you get scared that you can't make something happen and you'll want to take control of all the variables. And it's counterintuitive, but the more you take extra control of those variables, the worse you'll do. The more you try to manage every outcome, the less you'll empower great people to exceed your expectations. You know you're winning when somebody checks in a feature to the product that wasn't even in the spec and they sneak it in over the weekend because they didn't have time to ask permission and they didn't want to mess with the schedule. Those end up being the winning features of most products. And so that's, that's what I've seen over and over again with these startups that really win, that have extraordinary accomplishment, is they, they apply the hot team methodology to everything they do. And they, they have the types of people who are smart enough and committed enough that they respond. I'll give you another example why hot teams work. Let's say you're on the team and you're behind. Everybody else is up on schedule. Are you, gonna, are you gonna be the person that causes the schedule slip? Or are you gonna bust your ass over the weekend to get caught up? Well, it turns out a hot team will bust their, uh, that member will bust their ass over the weekend to get caught up. And the reason is they say, we agreed to the date. You know, management said you get to pick features or date. So they're keeping their end of the bargain, right? They're, they picked their thing, we picked ours. Now if we're late, there's nobody to blame but us. And if I let the team down, there's nobody to blame but me. And so, you know, I've seen situations before where somebody would get behind and gosh, you know, you almost had to stop them, but they would just live in their office for a week and a half. And you know, we'd like be sliding food under the door and stuff like that because the person was behind and they didn't want to let the team down. And so the other thing that a hot team allows you to do is create a set of conditions where Everyone is committed to doing something great and there's no plan B. And there's no excuses and there's no conversations in the hallway about not doing what we said we're gonna do. Um, so the only other thing I wanna say about hot teams is um, uh, hard work. So Ann and I have noticed, my partner Ann Mirko at Floodgate, and I have noticed that um, the companies that have the hardest working people win. And they're, they're, it's, it's sort of politically incorrect to say. A lot of people say, I want work-life balance. Um, I don't believe in work-life balance when you're an entrepreneur. Uh, time and again, if you stack rank the hardest working CEOs in our portfolio, they're the biggest money-making CEOs over and over again. And it's not surprising because there's always somebody who's really smart and will really work hard. 
and those are the people that are going to win. And some people I find in entrepreneurship say, gosh, I don't like that. I don't like hearing you say that. Other people relish that. They're like, this is the time in my life when I want to give all of myself to this idea that I am so passionate about. Those are the people who win. Uh, and anybody who tells you something different has an agenda because they're lying. Uh, and so uh, I've always found that when you're an entrepreneur, when you start a company, you have to be willing to say, am I willing to make this my top priority in life? And if you're not, that's okay, but just don't daydream you're running a thunder lizard because you're not. Um, the other, the, the, so then um, some folks um, before our talk also suggested that maybe I should talk about where, where we're seeing things going in the future after social networking. So um, have any of you all seen, seen my blog, blog with Roger McNamee? Uh, uh, it's just called rogerandmike.com. It's our hypernet blog. Uh, so our basic, the basic idea was that, um, like I said earlier, uh, I believe that the tech business evolves in waves. Uh, when I was a kid, uh, I was a child of the PC revolution. And so uh, the, the IBM personal computer and the Apple II and the Mac took off. And then after the PC revolution was client server. And after client server was the internet, and I believe after the internet was social networking. Um, my entire career strategy has been pick the next tech wave and ride it, either as an entrepreneur or as an investor. And so when I came to Silicon Valley, I basically said, I'm going to try to get into as many of the top 10 Web 2.0 startups as I can. It ended up being called social networking, but at the time we didn't know what to call it, so we just called it Web 2.0. Um, late last, well, actually early last year, I started to think that social networking was getting overplayed as a startup theme. Uh, they're, Twitter and Facebook and all these companies are valuable companies, but they're not startups anymore. And so I started to spend some time on a listening tour trying to think, what's the next big tech cycle? Uh, you know, what's going to be the next huge wave that creates a trillion dollars of value, like social networking did, or client server, or the internet before it, or the PC before it? And so um, in that process, I reconnected with an old friend of mine, uh, Roger McNamee. And Roger is one of the most celebrated investors in Silicon Valley, one of the few people who's actually succeeded in every single tech wave as an investor. Um, he invested in Microsoft before it was public, uh, so he pretty much crushed the PC wave. Uh, he was early in Oracle and Sybase and in Formix, uh, in the client server wave, in the internet wave. He was involved with Amazon. Oh, I forgot to mention in the PC revolution, he was also involved with electronic arts in, in the early days. And it, he's an investor in Facebook and Yelp. Uh, and and I, I was an investor in Twitter, so we seemed like a good pair to work on what the next thing would be. Uh, we concluded that the next thing is going to be what we loosely refer to as the hypernet. And so um, 2011 turns out to be a very profound year in the history of the technology business. Uh, 2011 was the first year that Microsoft Windows devices accounted for less than half of internet access devices. And that seems like, oh, is that that big of a deal? It's a huge deal because five years ago, they were over 90%. You know, five years ago, it was a pretty simple World Wide Web world. You basically had one web, you had Microsoft Windows accessing the web through a browser, and Google was the on-ramp. That was the web. Well, now there isn't one World Wide Web. There's the web, plus there's Facebook, plus there's Twitter, plus there's Evernote, plus there's Dropbox. You know, you have this world now of millions of clouds. Uh, and then we also believe that, you know, the things in our pockets and in our purses have changed the fundamental architecture of the internet. So we call it the hypernet is basically an expanded version of the internet that includes cellular and Wi-Fi and other future communication standards in addition to the traditional um, internet work that we think of as the internet. And then the hyperweb is the new set of user experiences enabled by a world of billions of nodes and millions of clouds. Uh, Roger and I believe that the hypernet hyperweb is the next big tech cycle. Um, what, what does that mean? We think there's going to be a lot of disruption. Um, 
Microsoft less than half of internet access devices, we believe that that means that fewer people will upgrade Windows and Office, for example. And they will redirect their spend in other places, in enterprises and in homes. Um, people do not search as often from post PC devices. Apple is trying to turn things from websites into apps. In both cases, Google loses because you can't crawl an app the way you can crawl the web. And you also, since you're not searching as much from a post PC device in the first place, Google's core business model is jeopardized in that scenario. Uh, I believe that the hypernet will also uh, re redefine TV and the viewing experience of TV the way Apple redefined the cell phone market five years ago. Uh, you know, if you look at our TVs right now, if we weren't so used to it, we'd revolt. You know, you look behind a TV, there's just a jumble of wires and crap going everywhere, and you have a ton of remote controls, and you gotta hire some dude to come into your house and put it together and program the Harmony remote and not use the other remotes. It's just ridiculous, it's just insane. And so, um, we believe that all of the functions of a set-top box will one day migrate to mobile devices and that you'll be able to carry those mobile devices anywhere in the world and zap your content to any screen you want in the world. Uh, and that that will totally transform the content viewing experience for people. Uh, and so those are the things that we're interested in right now. We're interested in companies that are in the early phases of building out the hypernet. Uh, and we've invested in some companies, some of which are stealth and some of which uh, you know, people have heard of uh, that, are, that are on that. But right now I'm probably devoting 70% of my investing energy uh, in, in that area. Uh, so, so one more thing then before I take questions. Uh, um, how many of you all are college educated? Okay. Um, I was at a wedding not long ago and I went through the airport and uh, I, I go through the security line and the, the guy from TSA says to me, how are you doing? And I said back to him, I'm, I'm doing great. How are you doing? And he goes, what does it look like? I'm living the dream. I'm a TSA guy. And I was like, okay, you know. But um, it kind of, you know, you have these moments in life that kind of really strike you. And... Um, most people in this world don't even live in a free society. Uh, you know, and for those people, your life is pretty much set. You know, you're, you're born how you're born, and that's kind of what, what's in it, what's in store for you. Uh, we happen to be a tiny fraction of the people in this world who live in free societies, who can pursue entrepreneurship, who can basically make the lives we want on our own terms. Most of the world would give everything they have for that. And so whenever I run into a person who has that set of privileges, who's in that position of privilege, and they're not doing something they're passionate about, I don't feel sorry for them. If you're not doing something that you're passionate about, you are flunking a cosmic IQ test. Um, because there are a lot of people in this world who would give anything to, to have that chance. And there are a lot of people in the past who made a lot of sacrifice so that even a small number of us could. Um, even, it, you know, if you do stuff that you're passionate about, you know, like the Dalai Lama once said, um, you know, if you, if you live an honorable life, um, you'll get to enjoy it twice because you'll look back on it and be glad for what you did. And I think the same is true of living a, a, a passionate life. Uh, you don't always even have to succeed monetarily in the short term, but someday, no matter how much money you make or how successful you are, it'll be about more than the money. It'll be about did you do things that you felt you were put in this world to do? And did you follow your heart sometimes to the detriment of what other people said, to, to the exclusion of the chatter that you heard around you, the tractor beam that tried to pull you into other things that would, that would seem good in the short term but not cause you to be your best self. And so um, the high order bit for me is 
don't if you're if you haven't found what you're passionate about don't settle keep looking uh, and if you if you see something that you get the heebie-jeebies about even though everybody's encouraging you to do it don't do it keep looking um, other than that there's probably about a million details but I probably ought to quit talking and take some questions so yeah. I'll start with you, a fellow child of the 60s. <laughs>
in order to make the cross-country call work. They had all the smartest people in the world who knew how to do that. All, all the telegraph guys had were telegraph experts. And so the telegraph company was not motivated to retaliate in the early days because they didn't see them as a threat. Their business model wasn't a threat. B but by the time they had an incentive to retaliate, it was too late. And AT&T had amassed a set of skills that ran them out of business. And so some of the best startups that we've seen, ironically, don't attack anybody at first. They start out by offering a good enough product to people who are thrilled just to have anything. And then from that base, they increase the viability of their product. It gets better and better and better over time. And by the time the incumbents realize it's a threat, it's too late. It's lights out. Um, what do you look for in your first hire? <coughs> Boy, that's a good one. Um, yeah, what do you look for in your first hire outside of founders? Um, the, the, the main thing I look for are um, people who are smart for their own sake. You know, um, I, t I tend to place a very high value on raw smarts um, because I think experience can be hired, but smarts is harder to hire, and you certainly can't teach somebody smarts. Um, the other thing that we look for, though, is a very high work ethic. Uh, we work for people, uh, we look for people who um, are a culture fit. So for example, some cultures are very collaborative and have team-based bonuses. Some cultures are more, the top 20% get more of the stock. And you know, we try to determine how, how closely that person matches the, the cultural beliefs of the original founders. Because if, if you have a cultural mismatch, you get confusion about how decisions get made. Uh, whereas if you have cultural congruence, a decision, it's easier to fly in formation uh, to make decisions. And then the other thing, we just, look, we just look for somebody who can crank. You know, who just, I mean, you know how it is. Some people can just freaking crank. When they gotta get something done, they just call upon their talent and their will and they just persevere and they just make it happen. And that, that, that kind of a kick-ass startup vibe ethos is really important. Yeah, so a network effect is a company where, so what, what is a network effect? So a network effect is a company where every new node on the network makes the whole network more valuable. So a great example of a network effect business would be Skype. You know, if I have Skype and you have Skype, now Skype's more valuable because we can use it together. And if you convince all your friends to have Skype, then it's even more valuable. Uh, and so like what, what we say is that it's called, you know, Moore's law is that the speed of computing doubles every two years. Metcalf's law, named after Bob Metcalf, the inventor of the ethernet, says that a network's value is in proportion to the square of the number of nodes in the network. And certain businesses have that set of characteristics. eBay is another one. It has all the buyers and sellers in one place. And so if I went to market tomorrow and said, my eBay transaction mechanism is faster than theirs, nobody would care. Or if I went to, to market and said, my new internet IP phone takes a third of the bandwidth of Skype, nobody would care. So a network effect is one where, by virtue of having more nodes on the network, the product or service itself is intrinsically more valuable. Network effects are probably the most durable advantage that you can have. Yeah. Um, and the, it, once you fund a company, like in the seed round, what are you looking for in terms of product traction? Do you want to see like quicker product development versus like figuring out the customer? Um, I'm just curious to know. Like, from a product yeah, yeah. You know, it's funny. The thing I've learned is like every company is kind of its own snowflake, right? So it's hard to it's hard to say that there's one set of things. The, the metaphor that we like, uh, I actually heard this from uh, Reed Hoffman, that um, uh, the founder of LinkedIn is now at Greylock. Um, he said to me one time, you know, starting a company is like jumping off a cliff with all the parts of a plane. And you've got to assemble the plane, get in the plane, and fly the plane before you hit the bottom of the cliff. And so the reason I think that metaphor is really robust is that, you know, 
If you have more money, the cliff is longer, right? If you have faster iterations, the cliff is longer. Um, if you're missing a propeller, it doesn't matter how much money, you know, if you jumped off the cliff and you don't have a propeller, you're out of business, right? There's, no, there's probably nothing you can do. And so what we're trying to do when we fund a startup is we're trying to really quickly figure out, did we just jump off the cliff with all the parts of the plane? So that's the first thing we need to know, right? We have a set of hypotheses when we invest. We're like, yeah, we think we have wings, we think we have a propeller, we think we have rudders, we think we have a pilot, all this stuff. But sometimes you get halfway down the cliff and you're like, uh-oh, we, we, we forgot the landing gear. Uh, well, I guess it doesn't matter if you have to fly, but whatever, bad, bad use of the analogy. But um, So that's one thing. The other metaphor I like to say is that a startup starts out dead and has to prove it's alive. And so in, in the early days, we, we sort of come into the first board meeting, we're like, all right, folks, we're dead. We better prove we're alive. How much time do we got? How much money do we have? How are we gonna, what set of experiments are we gonna run to see if we have a business? Uh, and so those are the, those are the things that, that, that's kind of the ethos that we're looking for, but we're expecting a lot of change, a lot of, you know, to use a football metaphor, audibles from the line of scrimmage, right? Um, you know, you're not, you're not going in with the first 10 plays defined. You're sort of going in and you're seeing what the world's gonna give you. And you know, anytime you find a gap or white space, you jump into it. And then from that, you go to the next thing, and then the next thing, and then the next thing. Yes, sir. I, I, don't, I don't think you can really know for sure. But I think that's where sort of the potential market comes into play. So like, like Twitter is a great example. Twitter was a very controversial investment. And because at the time, you know, when I met Ev and he was talking about Twitter, so I'd invested in his prior company, Odeo. And so Odeo is a podcasting company and Apple decides to give podcasting away on iTunes and they have a monopoly business in iPods. So you're like, okay, we don't have a business anymore, right? There's just no way we're gonna succeed at this. And so Ev says, okay, I'm gonna give everybody their money back. And, uh, and, I, and I'm like, well, you know, you don't owe me my money back, right? I took a risk, I, I get it, you know, that's startups, you know, it's called venture capital because it's an adventure, you know, that's how it works. And he goes, no, some of my investors are kind of disenchanted. And I think it'd be easier if I just gave everybody their money back. And so I said, well, okay, that's really nice, but I want to put it into your next deal. I don't even care what it is. And, and I said, are you, by the way, are you working on anything? And he said, well, I got this, uh, I got this side project. Uh, I'm not even sure if it's a product, much less a company. Uh, and I said, well, you know, what is it? Tell me about it. He goes, it's called, it's called, Twitter. It was spelled T-W-T-T-R at the time. And I was like, okay, um, well, what does Twitter do? And he goes, uh, you say what you're doing. And I was like, okay. And then what happens? And he goes, he goes, that's it. That's all it does. You say what you're doing. And I was like, okay. And, uh, uh, and he goes, oh, and one other thing. You do it in 140 characters or less. Because then we can do it on cell phones. Okay, well, um, is there a roadmap? You know, like, what's the roadmap? There is no roadmap. Uh, what's the revenue model? There is no revenue model. And I said, well, Evan, you know, why do you, why do you think this is a company? He said, well, first of all, I'm not sure it is. I'm not even sure it's a product. But he goes, my theory is that a whole lot of people in this world might want a microblog. And if a whole lot of people want to do microblogs, that just feels big, that feels meaningful. Uh, now, if Evan was a go with the crowd kind of guy, he would have given up way before it had a chance to take off at South by Southwest because everybody was telling him, this is a trivial, stupid thing, right? And you can't even keep the freaking site running, much less does this thing make any sense. And so what I find is that that's kind of where the passion comes in, you know, only you can have a sense for, do you believe that what you're doing is truly meaningful? The, the, the failure mode is that too many entrepreneurs have an idea that is not worthy of their talent and their passion. They want to play the startup game rather than change the world. When you're on something that you think is world changing, you know it. It's like a lot of things that are good in life. When you see the presence of it, you know it. And then you say, ah, all those other times when I thought I was there, 
this is what it feels like. And Twitter had that feeling. You know, it just like, for example, another company we're involved with, WordNick. They're trying to capture all the words in the world and all their meanings. I have no idea how that's going to make money. But that's just meaningful, right? They've, they've captured more words in the world by tenfold than any service in human history. And I just think that, that our competitive risk is zero in that deal. And all we have to do is find a way to apply that advantage to as many meaningful things we can. Um, but that's, you know, part of wh where Thunder Lizards come from is they're controversial in the early days. They don't, they don't quite seem to make sense, but they make sense to the founder because the founder sees something that the world doesn't see yet. Oh, oh like, like every investment, a combination of huge excitement and terror. You know, I'd go, uh, every other day I'd be like, this thing's going to change the world. And every other day I would say, I can't believe he gave me my money back and I threw it at this Twitter thing that makes no sense. And so you just, I mean, you have buyer's remorse and passion just as an alternating set of thoughts all the time. Uh, and, and, but, the, but the funny thing is, when you're feeling that feeling, that's usually the feeling that precedes success. You know, the feeling that doesn't precede success is, I wonder if everybody else thinks this is a hot deal. You know, that, those end up being the ones that we lose money on. Yeah, last. Um, the, the situation around Evan and, and your relationship with him was, was fairly unique. Um, if you had just been introduced to him from like warm contact and he pitched you Twitter, do you think that you would have still recognized this Thunder Lizard at the time? Um, I, you know, I have no idea. Uh, the, 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 the thing that maybe gave me somewhat of an advantage, though, was that it's kind of like this hypernet thing. The, the way I invest is I'll develop a hypothesis of sort of directionally where the world is going. And then I'll say to myself, I want to meet the hundred smartest people in that. And I want to make sure that every smart people doing something in that area knows who I am and wants to spend time together. And so I didn't meet Evan because I said, I want to find the best podcasting company or because Evan came and pitched me. I was going around talking to the hundred smartest people of Web 2.0 and I had a list of themes I was interested in. And somebody said, oh, well, if you're interested in that, you should go talk to Ev Williams. He's starting this podcasting company. And so um, the other thing is very few of the startups that I funded came inbound. Usually I was looking in an area and I don't, even, I don't even think of it as deal flow, I think of it as people flow. And I've always had the faith that if I meet the smartest people in a given area, the dots always just forward connect somehow. The deals always reveal themselves. But, I, but I, I, I'm not quite as good at kind of sitting in my office and taking inbound requests and, oh, I'll meet with this person, meet with that person. Because you're just not prepared to receive the insight. You know, when you're, you, you do your best investments when you're sort of interested in an area and when you meet that entrepreneur, you're pre you are prepared to receive the insight. And, uh, and not only that, you say, yeah, this person's gonna make it happen. Of all the people that I've seen, this person's gonna make it happen. When do you know that the idea is not working and it's better to quit and move on to the next thing? Yeah, and this is, so when do you, when, when do you decide to quit? You know, when, when is it no longer persistence and just stubborn futility? Uh, usually, here's how I do it. Um, when, we raise, when we raise money at Motive, or uh, when we invest money in a company, we try to have a set of hypotheses that we're testing with the round. So the way, the way I like to look at it is we're kind of like scientists. And we say, okay, I think that, that uh, a set of things are going to happen. If we put this product out into the market, a set of things will happen. Um, if they happen, then that proves the hypothesis. If they don't happen, then that disproves the hypothesis. Um, so in the course of doing that, we're either going to prove it decisively or we're going to disprove it decisively. What really happens with most entrepreneurs is when they've decisively disproven it, they don't want to believe it. Uh, they're, not, they're not able to be objective about, it's, and it's, it's not like Odeo failed, 
But that didn't mean Evan was a bad entrepreneur. It just meant Odeo was a bad business. And it would have been a tragedy if he'd beaten his head against the wall for another five years doing Odeo instead of doing Twitter. And so the best weapon I know that an entrepreneur can have to stay objective is to always have a set of hypotheses that they're testing. Yes. Why, don't I, why don't I take your question first and then since I'm... Okay. Let's see. Um, the Disruptor Field Guide by Scott Anthony. Uh, the chapter on mastering emergent strategies. Um, I, I still like Steve Blank's book a lot, Four Steps to the Epiphany. Um, what else? Uh, I, you know, I like this book called uh, Moonshot that talks about the moon landing. Um, you know, I often find that I get my best ideas about business not by reading business books. But, you know, you sort of, if you read a book about how people landed on the moon, it reminds you of all the right things, right? About thinking big and, you know, doing what it takes to win for a big goal. Oh, gosh, there's so many. Um, uh, I like this book. I always forget the name of it, but it's this book on business model design by Osterwalder, I think, uh, that talks about how to do business model designs and how to modify them and do pivots. Uh, I think Eric's book is pretty good, uh, The Lean Startup. Uh, yeah, but you know, it's funny, I don't read that many business books, to be perfectly honest. I read a lot more books about uh, people who accomplish something really spectacular. You know, like there's this book by a guy named Bennis called Great Groups. I like that book. It'll take groups like the people on the Manhattan Project or, you know, people who, who cured the polio with the polio virus or, you know, stuff like that. Um, and then I, I like some of Malcolm Gladwell's books. Like I thought Outliers was a good book and Blink and stuff like that. Yeah, and I, and I, wish, I wish I had a satisfy. So my answer is going to not satisfy you because I've been asked this a couple times. So it's sort of like, I, what if I'm in a chicken and egg situation and what, what do I have to solve the chicken or the egg first? Or like, what do I have to do to convince you that it's solvable, right? Um, the reality in my world is that we get 150 business plans a week. And we have to decide which one has a, the best chance of being one of the 10 plus or minus five special companies of the year. And everyone's different, everyone's its own unique snowflake. And that's part of like the art of the business is figuring out what combination of the market and the people and the timing and everything else has to come together for this thing to be one of those. And, and it's always unsatisfied, but if there, was, if there was a way I could answer it in a universal way, everybody would find the 10 plus or minus five companies all the time, right? And so that's, that's the arc, right? Is how do, you, how do you spot those special snowflakes, you know, in a sky full of them? How do you spot the few that are gonna be and every time you think you know what the pattern is, it's a humbling game, right? And so, you know, every time you think you know, like I like to make fun of any investor who's too confident in his knowledge because I think that the day you think you know is where you're vulnerable to making a bunch of boneheaded choices. And it's sort of like to be a good investor, I think you have to be sort of like Joe Colombo detective. You have to be this always on truth seeker, always believing you don't really know. And you, you can't ever believe, oh yeah, I've seen it all. Um, you know, I think there's sort of a, there's a standard, there's kind of a standard answer and a not so standard answer. Um, I, I think that of all the seed funds, we try the hardest to back the really meaningful companies. Uh, we see a lot of companies where we know we'd make money if we did the investment, but it just doesn't, we, don't, we can't honestly look at ourselves and say, I'm gonna have been truly proud to have been something, a part of that thing. Uh, so I think that might be one. Now everybody will say, well, we try to hunt thunder lizards, but 
you know, to some degree, you either have them in your portfolio or you don't, and it's kind of an existence proof, you know. Um, and so I guess that's one thing. The other thing, though, and this is the part that that I, I hope it's probably the most satisfying part of it, is uh, what, what have we been like when the chips were down? You know, um, it's funny, we're, we're sitting here in Rally right now, right? So Rally is the company upstairs and we happen to fund Rally. I seed funded it with Reed Hoffman. And uh, we got into a situation where we, we'd gotten our burn a little bit higher than we should have, and we had a month's left of cash. And we weren't gonna be able to raise the money that we needed to raise in a month with that kind of a burn, with th that little cash left. And so Tom Saris and I are like, what are we gonna do? Hmm, what, you know, I have no idea. And so, um, so I was like, well, you know, I'm friends with uh, Naval Ravikant over at Angel List, and I'm gonna be on a panel with them. So Naval and I had lunch, and we're like, what, what? I was like, well, this may be totally wacky, but what if we tried to do a crowdfunding Series A for Rally? And he's like, let's do it. Let's give it a whirl. So we ended up raising $7.9 million in 10 days doing this crowdfunding thing. And we would have just gone out of business, right? I mean, we wouldn't have, we wouldn't have had the money. We would have just run out of money and out of time. Uh, or, you know, like Dave and Miyoshi at Mesmo TV. Or, you know, there were plenty of people that Evan gave the money back to at Odeo, just took their money back. Um, you know, Osman Rashid at Chegg, uh, we used to be Craigslist for colleges. Facebook decides to get in classifieds. We have one month of cash left. We're like, okay, we're out of business, right? If Facebook fails at classifieds, nobody's going to fund us to do it. And if they succeed, well, they're going to run us out of business anyway. And we got a month of cash. And so now, so, so he's like, I want to test this textbook rental idea. And I just need 90 days, and I either want to, I don't want to, I'd rather burn out than fade away. So I want to bet it all on textbook rentals. So I just need you to give me one chance to do this textbook rental thing. And so probably the, the most satisfying outcomes have been the ones where, you know, when the chips were down, um, we, we, we stood by the team and, um, you know, weren't sort of like, well, that's your problem. What are you going to do about it? But we sort of got in the foxhole with them and helped them MacGyver an answer. And, and by the way, I think that's true. You know, I think that the VC of the future is going to be one who has entrepreneurial DNA and investor DNA. Uh, you know, I think that Peter Thiel has this. I think Reed Hoffman has this. I think Andreessen has it. Horowitz has it. Uh, Josh Koppelman. Um, you know, I like to joke, you know, you wouldn't want a fat personal trainer, right? And, um, you know, I think that the, that, the, that the VCs of the future, we live in a world of such dynamism that they have to be capable of partnering with the entrepreneur to MacGyver crazy outcomes where, you know, there was no linear path to success, but together you just came up with some out of the box crazy answer that actually worked. And so, um, so I think we've been better than most at that. And you know, you think about those examples, if those things hadn't ha happened, those companies wouldn't have survived, right? That we, we wouldn't know them as the successes they are. Well, that's not true of Twitter. Tr Twitter would have done fine without me, for sure. But, um, but the, the, the ones that we, the ones that kind of saw, were staring death in the face and we gave it one last shot and it took off after that. NG Moco got close. Uh, and so I'd like to think that we're the best to work with during the many near-death experiences that startups have. Yeah. Um, let's see. I guess my, my feeling is that um, here, are the, here are the failure modes I've seen. One failure mode is... Um, a bunch of passionate people argue about the right answer inside the building. So it becomes your vision versus my vision. And so I like to say that, uh, you know, my opinion is interesting but irrelevant because I'm not a customer. And that answers only exist outside of the building. And that it shouldn't be your idea versus mine, 
what we should do is list a set of hypotheses on the board that we want to test. And we need to, we need to depersonalize what we're testing and we need to, facts are facts, facts are stubborn. And so what I see, one failure mode I see is a lot of, um, a lot of teams can fail to be fact-based when they need to be. But the corollary is that I see some teams now, they iterate to no end. And so they're playing the startup game. I want to put out a website, see what people do, make the button orange instead of yellow, see if I get more click-throughs, you know, tweet this out, Facebook that, like this. But they, they didn't, they, they, they had a great way to, they were iteration rich and, and vision poor. And so, you know, you don't want to be vision rich and strategy poor, but you also don't want to be an awesome tactician going nowhere. Uh, and so that's, I think that the key is to complement a compelling vision with a strategy that's fact-based and focused on low burn experimentation and proving and disproving hypotheses at, at low cost and burn and time. You know, you don't run out of money, you run out of iterations. 